And God's people said, Amen. Let us worship the triune God. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who are in awe of him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Gracious Father, we come to you now because you have called us here. We know that we could not have come unless you had called. We could not have loved you unless you have loved us first. We could not have believed in you unless you have given us the gift of faith. Father, as we gather for worship now, we lift up our hearts to you. And so we lift up all our hurts, all our sorrows, all our successes, all our victories, all our confusions, all our uncertainties, all our anxieties, all our questions. And as we lift up all that we are and all that is happening around us, we fix our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith. We fix our eyes on Jesus who endured the cross, scorning its shame for the joy that was set before him. We fix our eyes on the risen Jesus who has conquered sin, death, and the devil, who reigns seated at your right hand until every enemy has become his footstool. You are the source, the fountainhead, the arche, the infinite treasury of all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding, all glory, all goodness, all peace, all comfort. And so we seek these things from you and nowhere else. For we have died and our lives are already hidden with Christ in you. And so we worship you now in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end, and amen. Gathered here to worship the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one eternal God in three persons, world without end. He is the creator of all that is, the sustainer of all that is, the governor, the king, the sovereign Lord of every square inch, of every star, in every galaxy, down to every last grain of sand, every single hair on your head, every sparrow on every tree, every flower in every field, directing the exact velocity and trajectory and shape and story of every fleck of snow. And our Lord Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry about tomorrow about what you will eat, what you will wear, your homework, the dishes, the kids, your health, your life. For we serve the King, the Lord, the governor of every detail in all the universe. There is not one detail outside his loving control. All that is constantly obeys his sovereign command. There is not one single cancer cell that has gone rogue. There is no evil man or woman hiding from God. There is no storm cloud plotting to thwart the good plans of our King. Our Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life in the midst of this sin-infested world. He walked for us. He obeyed for us. He was righteous for us, and then he was accused for us. He was condemned for us, beaten for us, mocked for us, crucified for us, buried for us, and then he rose from the dead for us. And faith is the call to hold all this together. If he, our sovereign reigning king, spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not now with him freely give us all things? This is how we know that all things must work together for good for those who have been called according to his purpose. This is how we know that nothing can separate us from his love. And not only that, but that every single detail of this world must serve his purpose in order that all these things, that in, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Those fears, those anxieties, those regrets, those failures, those difficulties, those questions must serve their king. And so you must not fear. You have been purchased by the blood of the king. You are utterly, infinitely safe in him so that whether we live or die, all will be well. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This reminds us of our need to confess our sins, so as we prepare to do so, please turn to Psalm 70 on page 8 and 9 in your bulletin. The text this morning is from the first chapter of Colossians, verses 21 through 29. These are the words of God. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, 
if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily." Our Father and God, we thank you for your kindness to us in bestowing this word upon us. I pray your spirit would be present here with us today, uh, spreading this word into the corners of our lives. I pray that we would see where you want obedience, where you want us to be encouraged. I pray that we'd respond to your word according to the work of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So as we continue through the book of Colossians, remember that Colossa was a Gentile city in what is now uh, modern Turkey, uh, then Asia Minor, a uh, province of the Roman Empire, and that the church there had been planted about 10 years prior to this letter, and the church had been planted by Epaphras. As a Gentile church, they were in a good position to hear about the mystery of Christ, hidden for long ages past, but now manifested in them. As we will see, the mystery of Christ, the mystery that was hidden for long ages past, had to do with the Gentiles, and it was fulfilled in the Gentiles receiving in themselves Christ, the hope of glory. That It was not for the Jews only. So, consider this text. Before the gospel had been brought to them, before they had received the word, the Colossians were dead in their sins. <clears throat> As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, remember um, these letters were written at the same time. There, um, there are many parallels. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. It says at the beginning of chapter 2 of Ephesians, before the gospel had been brought to the Colossians, they were dead in their sins. Paul says, as he refers it to them, he says that they used to be alienated and enemies in their minds by their wicked works, but now they had been reconciled. So you, you used to be alienated from God. You used to have a wall between you and God. There used to be a chasm between you and God. You were an enemy to God. You were alienated from God. You were hostile to him. You were a God hater. But now you have been reconciled. Verse 21. This reconciliation had been brought about through the death of Jesus so that they might be made holy in the sight of God. Verse 22. So there was something that the death of Jesus accomplished and that something was to take, en take enemies and transform them into friends, to bring them near. They were far off, they had been brought near, and it was the cross of Jesus that did it. It was the death of Jesus that did it. This gospel, Paul says, is something they must continue in. This is the gospel that was preached to them and to everyone. Verse 23, we are not saved uh, from drowning by putting on a life jacket. We are rather saved by putting one on and keeping one on. When you are drowning, you are not saved by putting on a life jacket. I must, I must be okay. I put on a life jacket, yes, but then you took it off. Now, this is the difference between the truncated, once saved, always saved doctrine and the reformed understanding of the preservation and perseverance of the saints. God says that the elect of God cannot fall away. The elect of God cannot lose their salvation because their salvation is not a possession of theirs like car keys. If your salvation were a possession of yours, like your car keys or your phone, you could misplace it. You could, spend, you could misplace it forever. You could check the lost and found three weeks in a row and not, find, never, not ever find it again. Anything that you own, you are capable of losing. But salvation is not like that. Salvation is a matter of Christ owning you. Christ doesn't lose what he owns. 
Right? We, we lose what we own. We can do that. But Christ doesn't lose what he owns. And if Christ owns someone, he keeps him in every respect. He keeps him in holiness. He, he, uh, he preserves his elect. They persevere. They're kept. They're protected. They're guarded to the end. That's the, that's the preservation and the perseverance of the saints. This is in distinction from the idea that you can go forward at a revival meeting, pray a prayer, you said the prayer, you wrote in the back of the little Bible that you prayed the prayer on this date, and then it doesn't matter how you live after that because once saved, always saved. That is a false, pernicious, and destructive doctrine. At the same time, it is, uh, we don't want to rob God's people of the consolation of knowing that God is going to keep you. God is going, God, if, if you are called by God, you are saved by putting on the life preserver and keeping it on, and God is going to ensure, if you're among his elect, that you're going to keep it on. He is not, he is not going to abandon the work that he has started. So, as a minister, Paul says that he now fills up the sufferings of Christ for the sake of the body of Christ, which is the church. That's verse 24. He was made a minister of this gospel for the sake of the Colossians in order to fulfill the word of God. 25. He is talking about the mystery which God had hidden for ages, but which he has now made manifest to the saints. Verse 26. So the mystery that used to be hidden is now open. The mystery that used to be tucked away is now made manifest and is made manifest in the church to the saints. Verse 26. What is that mystery? This mystery is Christ within the Gentiles. This mystery is Christ, the, the, the anointed one of God, the Messiah for the Hebrew people, the Messiah, the Christ, within the Gentiles. That's the mystery. So the Christ who is given, who is going to be given to the world through the Jews, through the instrumentality of the Jewish nation, was not given through the instrument of the Jews for the Jews. It was given through the instrumentality of Israel for the world. That's the, that's the mystery. And Christ is now in the Gentiles. Christ within the Gentiles, verse 27, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Gentiles are welcomed to the glory the same way that the Jews have been invited to the glory, summoned to the glory all the way through the Old Testament. So this is the Christ that Paul preaches, both warning and teaching, and with the goal of presenting every man complete in Christ. That is the goal of pastoral ministry. The goal of pastoral ministry is to get everybody complete in Christ. And we know that this is not a human work, it's the work of the Holy Spirit through the instrumentality of grace, through the, the means of grace that God's appointed. But one of the things that God's appointed is pastors and elders and people who work with, work with the saints, and they're to work with the saints to bring them to this conformity to the image of Christ, to bring them to this completeness, to this maturity in Christ, verse 28. And that is the end toward which Paul labors, struggling to get out what God is working in, verse 29. Paul struggles to work out what God is working into him, and we'll talk about that more shortly. So let's go back and focus on some of the key elements of this, uh, of this passage. The Colossians were alienated in their minds. They were alienated in their minds, and Paul says they were alienated in their minds because of their wickedness, because of their sins. A very consistent element in Paul's anthropology, Paul's doctrine of man, Paul's doctrine of fallen man, is this. It's his awareness of what sin does in us, how sin works in us. What sin does in us, how sin works in us. We tend to think that the fall did not affect mental processes. We tend to think that the fall doesn't touch your mind. The fall affects the flesh, and the fall affects the world, and the fall affects the ground and the weeds that grow out of the ground. But when I'm thinking or when I'm feeling certain things, those, are, those thoughts are to be trusted. Those feelings are to be trusted. They are not. They are, they are deceitful. The heart is deceitful, the scripture says. The mind, the heart, the will, all of it is a uh, pack of liars. So we, need to, we tend to think that the thoughts I think, if I make a mistake in my thinking about God and man and sin and salvation, if I make a mistake there, then it's possible for that mistake to be a mistake, but it's an innocent mistake. 
It's, a, it's an innocent, innocent mistake, and because I make that mistake and I'm not convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, I therefore go downstream, and then as a result of that, I find myself embroiled in sin. I fall, I fall into sins because of this mental error, but the whole process of degradation began with something that was innocent or comparatively innocent. It was an honest mistake, we say. Paul doesn't think that at all. Paul reverses this. They were enemies in their minds, and they were alienated, alienated in their minds because of their wicked works. Verse 21, sin provides you with a motive for rationalization. Sin provides you with a motive to rationalize, and you use your mind as an instrument for that rationalization. There's a wonderful phrase in the Westminster Confession of Faith when it's talking about marriage and divorce. It says on this subject of marriage and divorce, basically because of lust, men are apt to quote unquote study arguments, right? They want to get away, get out of this marriage and they want to get over there with Susie Q and consequently they say, let's have a Bible study. Let's do a deeper study. Let's study arguments. Let's find out what the Greek word means and let's, let's pursue it. Let's study arguments. And what that is, is rationalization. Paul says that we are in, slaves to sin, we're in bondage to sin, we're dead in our, uh, dead in our sins, and, and, we, and yet we still have active minds, and these active minds provide us with rationalizations to justify what we want to continue to do. We want to continue to be bitter against that person, and so we rationalize. We want to continue to lust, and so we rationalize. It's not that bad. We want to continue to pursue these various sins that have us in their grip in our lives, and so we become, we, we become um, uh, self-justifying in our thought processes. So Paul says that Paul's talking here about the Colossians prior to the gospel coming to them, and that's where this uh, process is uh, seen in an advanced degree. And Paul says, you were alienated in your minds because of your sins. Your sins were the thing that caused you to think the way that you do. So Paul reverses this. They were enemies in their minds and they were alienated in their minds because of their wicked works. Sin leads to intellectual futility, not the other way around. Sin leads to intellectual futility, not the other way around. The heart drives the head. The heart drives the head. It's not the head driving the heart. We pretend that we're rational. We pretend that we are in charge, we're self-composed, and that we, whatever we honestly believe to be the truth, that we pursue. Before conversion, that is utterly untrue. That is false. All our thoughts are vanity. All our thoughts are chasing after wind. And we are simply seeking a way to maintain the status quo, which is in charge of our own lives, or in charge of our own lives as we think. So in other words, our false and heretical opinions are not honestly come by. False and heretical opinions are not honestly come by. In addition, whenever the gospel of grace is diluted, altered, or rejected in the church, it is not long before the deep reason, the lusts of the heart, begin to come out into the light of day. When, when you start to minimize the gospel or minimize who Jesus was or you, or you start to cast doubt on the authority of the word of God, the serpent, what, is the, what does the serpent say in the first temptation? Did God really say? Is this really God's word? Is this, some, is, is this really from God? Whenever that sort of thing starts to happen and, and it comes to you in the guise of a rational argument or scholars believe or modern science has shown or uh, deep psychology has revealed, all of that stuff, all of that stuff is making room for lust. All of it. All of it is making room for you to have a little maneuvering room so you can carve out a space to do what you want to do. When, when you were non-believers, when you were back, back in the non-Christian days, and it was all that way, you remember, those of you who were converted as adults, those of you who were converted later, you remember how, how dark that was, how, how, how many blind alleys there were. It, it's, it sounds good at first, and you like, you like how it flatters the autonomy that you want, but it is utterly unsatisfying. It can, you were, how can you be satisfied when you're an enemy to God? How can you be satisfied when you're alienated in your mind with the God who made you? You are out of sync. You are, you are in a disjointed, dislocated 
uh, relationship with the ground of all truth, love, honor, justice, kindness, you're out of sync with all of that. And that, that means it cannot go well. It cannot go well. That's why the Colossians were alienated in their minds because of their wicked works. Um, all intellectual clear thinking begins, therefore, with confession of sin. You cannot be a clear thinker unless you're humble. You cannot be a clear thinker unless you acknowledge your sins, unholy sins, before a holy God. Then the path, then God grants forgiveness, and he sets you upright, takes you out of the miry clay, puts you on the rock, and then you can, th then you can see, then you can think straight. So the Colossians had been in a bad way. The Colossians had been in a bad way, and Paul's reminding them of this because they had been in this bad way 10 years before, or the church, uh, the church as a whole. Now, presumably, there were additional converts coming in uh, just maybe a year, or two, uh, a year or two before, and they, they could still maybe remember up by themselves. But it's always good to have God's people reminded of what you were saved from. You were saved from intellectual futility and intellectual darkness. So Paul then says that he completes the sufferings of Christ in his body. And th this is a curious expression. He says that he completes the sufferings of Christ in his body. And we have to spend just a moment here, lest anybody think that the sufferings of Christ for redemption were in any way inadequate or in need of being completed. Jesus didn't do a partial job on the cross. When, uh, when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, that was the definitive word. It was completed. Redemption was accomplished. Redemption was fulfilled. John Murray wrote a wonderful book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, and that's the distinction we're going to be talking about here. The, the, the Son of God accomplished redemption in his death, burial, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit applies it. The Holy Spirit brings that atonement to bear on individual lives, and he uses the instruments of preachers and evangelists and teachers. He, he uses the instruments of apostles and church planters like Paul. And that applica the application of the gospel is attended just like the formation of the gospel was attended with great suffering on the part of the Son of God alone. So the application of the gospel is attended with much suffering on the part of proclaimers of the word. So when Paul says this in verse 24, he immediately adds that he was made a minister, that is a servant, an instrument for delivering something. Paul was made a minister of the word, which means that he fulfills the sufferings of Christ's body that were related to the proclamation of it, not that which was related to the laying of the foundation for it. Christ died once for all, and that cannot be supplemented. Paul can say, you know, did Paul die for you? you know, no, no, Paul didn't, Paul didn't die on the cross. Paul wasn't buried. Paul wasn't raised. That's not, he had no role in that. We have no role in that. Christ alone suffered once for all. But the message, but the message of that death can and must be supplemented. The message of that death has to go out to the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So the, the gospel itself cannot be supplemented. The preaching of the gospel needs to be supplemented every day. It needs to be added to every day. Somebody else must go out to a new tribe. Somebody else must go preach to a disobedient nation. Someone else must declare the judgments of God to an apostate nation. So there are countless sufferings that are connected with those countless preachers. There are countless sufferings that are connected to those countless preachers. This is suffering. This is the suffering of Christ's body, but in a different sense. Christ's human body suffered on the cross, and that was it. Christ's body, in that we are the body of Christ, Christ's body, in the proclamation of the gospel, in the spreading of the gospel, we're not anywhere close to being done. So remember that the Lord Jesus, who had completed his redemptive suffering, Jesus died, was buried, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven to the right hand of God. When, when Jesus there at the right hand of God looked down on Paul on the Damascus road, he asked why Paul was persecuting him. 
Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, Paul, if he'd been feeling argumentative, which he wasn't at that moment, but if he'd been feeling argumentative, he could say, what do you mean persecuting you? You're in heaven. I can't reach you. Yeah. But the Lord says, but you can reach my body, and my body is my body. My body, these are my people. And when you persecute, when you persecute the saints of God, you are persecuting God himself. When you're persecuting the saints of Christ, you are persecuting Christ. So Paul, uh, Paul is asked on the Damascus Road by Jesus, why are you persecuting me? Acts 22, 7. So from the martyr Stephen, from the martyr Stephen to the arrest of Wang Yi, the pastor of Early Rain Church in China, to the very last martyr who will suffer before the Lord comes again, the body of Christ suffers to proclaim what the Lord's body suffered to establish. So Jesus in his human body suffered to establish the gospel. The church, the body of Christ, suffers to proclaim, to extend, to apply. And that suffering is necessary. Paul says it, he, he fills it up. He's, he, he wants to extend himself, expend himself in this way. There is, ab there is absolutely no way to take the gospel of forgiveness to the world in its current condition without having the world react violently. The world will react violently and persecute, and God will call his elect out from among their number. And then they will try to, they will viciously try to defeat it with persecution and defeat. And when that fails, as it always does, they will then try to defe defeat the church with making it successful. So the devil has two weapons he deploys against the church. One is persecution and defeat, and the other is success. And generally, looking over 2,000 years, the church has handled being defeated far better than we've handled being successful. Being successful is the really hard challenge for us. Now, I believe it's a challenge God wants us to tackle. I believe that God wants us to go for it. I believe that he, want, he wants, in Hebrews 11, in that great hall of faith, it says that some of God's saints had to hide in caves and were sawn in two and were persecuted, and others routed armies and received back the dead, for, uh, the, uh, uh, received back from the dead um, uh, those that they had lost. There, was, there were tri great triumphs and there were great defeats, and all of them were God's triumphs. We need more work on succeeding than we do on failing. Generally, the church shines in times of persecution. Generally, the church shines in times of persecution. Not always, but usually. And the church often becomes corrupt and complacent and laid back in ways it shouldn't in times of ease. It's not, it's not good to be at ease in Zion. We want to preach the gospel. We want to declare the gospel in such a way as to contribute our share of filling up the sufferings of the body of Christ. We want to proclaim it in such a way that we are part of that, that we are participants of that. So what is a mystery? I've, I've alluded to this before. We tend to think of a mystery as something that is hidden, period. A mystery, well, uh, who did that? You say, I don't know, it's a mystery. It's a mystery means I don't know. So in common parlance, a mystery is something you don't know. A mystery novel is, um, a good mystery novel is one where you don't know who done it until the last few pages or the last chapter. That's a mystery. A mystery is what you don't know. A mystery is what you don't understand. A mystery is what you don't get. But in Paul's vocabulary, a mystery was something that was bound up for ages and generations, but which was eventually revealed and manifested to all. So the mystery is now open. The mystery is now declared. The mystery is now no longer mysterious. And of course, if we limit ourselves to the New Testament, it's eventually going to become strange to refer to it as a mystery at all. What is a mystery? What everybody knows. Well, if that's, if that's how you're tackling it, then that's going to become odd, right? But that, and that's what has happened, I think, because Christians have gravitated to New Testament literacy, and they're not steeped in the Old Testament. If you're reading your Bible, if you are reading your Bible over and over, and it's, and it's been, it, you know, it's not been 
15 years since you've read Deuteronomy, if you're, just read, if you're a regular Bible reader, you're going to be steeped in the longing of Israel for the Messiah to be revealed. You're going to be steeped in a literature that yearns for something to happen. And you're going to be steeped in a literature that is not quite sure what it is exactly that's going to happen when it happens. But something's going to happen. If you didn't know anything about the Christian faith, if you didn't know anything about the Bible, and someone just gave you the Old Testament, and that's all. They just gave you the Old Testament. And let's say you had a lot of time on your hands, and so you read through the Old Testament two or three times. You would come back to the person who gave it to you, and you would say something like, where's part two? Where's the, where's the sequel? This makes no sense without the sequel. All of it is yearning toward the coming of the Messiah. Well, if you just, if, if you just focus on the New Testament and you are thinking about the revealed Messiah, you're not, you're not focusing on a revealed Messiah who was concealed for many ages, that was hidden for many ages. That's, this is one argument among many about why we ought to be Bible readers, uh, reading, the old, the, reading the whole thing. So, it's an open reality throughout the New Testament. If we're steeped in the Old Testament, however, if we remember that the Jews were our elder brothers in the faith, and they didn't know exactly how this was going to all come out, they knew that something was up. They knew that something was big. Abraham rejoiced to see the day of Jesus, and he rejoiced and was glad. There were, there were visions and portents that were given to Old Testament saints, but they had to piece them painstakingly together. And Peter tells us that the angels in heaven didn't even know what was up. Right? They were, they, the angels longed to look into these things. So if we're steeped in the Old Testament, if we remember that the Jews were our elder brothers, then the fresh and potent nature of this revealed mystery is going to remain with us. Paul works through this same glorious truth in the second chapter of Ephesians. If you only read the New Testament, it will just be a matter of time before you don't understand the New Testament. If you only read the New Testament, it's just a matter of time before you don't get the New Testament. This all hangs together. All scripture, Paul says in Timothy, is profitable, is God-breathed and profitable for instruction and training in righteousness and for establishing God's people. All of scripture. That includes the genealogies. That includes Second Chronicles. That includes First Chronicles. That includes Leviticus. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. So, we get to the content of the mystery. What is the content of the mystery? That is summed up in the phrase, two phrases here, the riches of the glory, and then it is amplified by the phrase, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, um, uh, one popular cliche um, uh, standard phrase among evangelicals in North America is ask when people become Christians, they ask Jesus into their heart. Now, that's not a common biblical way of speaking. Right? It's, uh, you're not, usually we don't think of it as asking um, Jesus into our lives, in, if we're speaking scripturally. We, we are asking to be let into his life. We, we're, we're asking to be ushered into him. So uh, the Bible doesn't usually speak of Christ in us, but it does occasionally, and this is one of those places, Christ in you. If you're a Christian, if you're one of God's elect, if you're truly converted, if you're born again, Christ is in you. But Christ is not just in you doing nothing. He's not in you hidden. He's not hidden in you the way he was hidden in the Old Testament. He's hidden in you. He, he's, he's in you, not hidden in you. He's in you as the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is a message this is a message that Paul says, he declares very clearly, it's hidden. But where is it hidden? It's hidden throughout the, all the Old Testament. But now that Christ has risen from the dead and has given his spirit to saints all over the world, it is fairly easy now to trace that unfolding mystery as we read the scriptures. Sure, now that we see it, we cannot stop seeing it. But we must also not stop seeing it. We must remember Christ is in you and he is the hope of glory. Now, let me uh, make a tangential comment uh, off to the side, but not really off to the side because it's, it's key to understanding this. Men, women, all, all human beings are glory hunters. 
We, we are made to pursue glory. We are made to seek glory. We can't do anything but seek glory. We, uh, we can no more do without glory than we can do without oxygen or food or drink. We need glory. But because we're sinners, we have rebelled against the glory of God. What is, what is sin? Sin is to fall short of the glory of God, right? Sin is to bend glory. It's to pursue the wrong glory. It's to embrace vain glory. So there are only two choices for people in this world, and that is to pursue glory in Christ and to see Christ as their hope of glory or to try to manufacture their own glory, try to make their own glory. You, and, and so everything boils down to this. Are you going to chase glory God's way or are you going to chase glory your way? If you chase glory your way, it's going to end up in a ditch. It's going to end up inglorious. It's going to end up putrid and corrupt. Vainglory rots. Vainglory comes to pieces in your hands. Vainglory is that which reveals itself at the end of your life, at the end of decades of pursuing it, with, as a phantasm. It just comes apart. It just floats away. For all your life, you were pursuing that all of your life, you, you, you were hungry for that. I believe it was one of the, uh, I think it was uh, Rockefeller who was asked um, the, initial, the, the first Rockefeller on his deathbed, how much, how much money is enough? How much money is enough? And he said, just a little more. Just a little more. What is that? That's the pursuit of vainglory. That's the pursuit of vainglory. We want Christ in us, the hope of glory, and Christ in us, the hope of glory, is going to um, establish us in every good word and work. And we're going to find ourselves not alienated from God, not enemies to God, because Christ is in us, and we are working together with his purpose for us. And that brings, um, that brings us to uh, the last section of this passage. And, and as, we, as we go on, don't forget... Missions are central to this because there are a lot of Gentiles yet to go. All right, what, what, is the, what is the mystery? It's Christ in the Gentiles, Christ in you. You Colossians, right? You Colossians, it's, the Christ is in you. That's the hope of glory. That's the revealed mystery. 2,000 years later, there are many more Gentiles that have Christ in them, the hope of glory, than, than 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years from now, there will be many more. Missions are central because this is all about manifesting, declaring, revealing the mystery, which is Christ in the Gentiles, the hope of glory proclaimed to the world. Now, at the tail end of this passage, there's something that, uh, that is a, a fundamental lesson that we need to learn with regard to how we pursue sanctification, how we pursue walking as Christians. Now, notice what Paul says. Uh, he, he says here something that is very similar to the principle that he sets out in Philippians. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Notice that. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out what God works in. Work out your salvation. Why? Because God is working your salvation into you. God works your salvation in and you work it out. If you are working it out and God's not working it in, what that, the name for that is frustration. What you're trying to do is you're trying to pump water out of a dry well. You're trying, to, you're, trying to get, you're trying to get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness to come out when it's not in. It's not going in. So you work out what God works in, and you are to make sure that God's working it in as you work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God's at work in you to willing to do for his good pleasure. God works in according to his good pleasure, and you work out according to your good pleasure. God works in according to his good pleasure, and you work, you work out what he works in, and you do it according to your good pleasure. That reminds me of what Augustine once said, where he said, love God and do as you please. Love God and do as you please. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. 
All right, so if you love God, what you please is going to be righteous. What, uh, uh, in Psalm 37, 4, uh, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Because of course, if you're delighting in the Lord, the desires of your heart are not going to be kinked. They're not, gonna, they're, they're not going to have something wrong with them. So God works it in, you work it out. So how does Paul express that same truth here? He says that he labors. Now, as it happens, his labor is in the labor of ministry. He says he labors in line with God's working or energy, which works in him with power. A man or woman who labors in the church doing plenty of good stuff is going to burn out. Someone who works really hard in the church is going to burn out unless it is an outworking of God's prior inworking. You're going to burn out. You're going to, you're going to be a little cinder. You're going to be a burnt out match. If you're, if you're doing it because this is what is expected in this social organization that I found myself in the middle of, and they want me to volunteer for this and volunteer for that and volunteer for the other thing, and I'm doing all this stuff. No, you are to receive what God works in by faith and by that same faith, work out into the world what God has worked into you. All right, you, you can't export what's not being manufactured. You can't export what's not being grown in your country. If your country doesn't grow wheat, you can't export wheat. If your country's not growing lentils, you can't export lentils. If your country's not manufacturing wi widgets, you can't export widgets. You cannot minister to other people if you're a dry well. You, you need to, you need to uh, pursue Christ. You need to cultivate your relationship with Christ. You need to know that Christ is in you, the hope of glory, and then you can share glory with others. You can work out the hope of glory as God is manifesting in you the hope of glory. And faith works through love. Galatians 5, 6. If you give away everything to the poor but have no love, it's nothing. If you give your body to be burned and there's no love in it, it's zip, zilch, nada. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. And so, how does Paul put it here? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. What kind of goal, what kind of ministry goal did Paul set for himself there? Think about that as a ministry goal. Warning every man, teaching every man, and presenting every man perfect. <laughs> A little ambitious, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. His energy works in us mightily when we are glorifying God by manifesting to the world that I'm not the one, it's not, we're not the ones doing this. We're not coming up with this. We're not originating this. God among his people, when Christ is in you, the hope of glory, when non-believers are attracted to the love that is exhibited among the saints, when they're attracted to this community, the central pull, the central thing that should, should be drawing them is attraction to the loveliness of Christ, the glory of Christ, the presence of Christ. It's not a bunch of moralistic people who have learned to obey certain social codes and who wear neckties on Sunday. That's not what, that, that is a superficial external thing. We, we want to love one another and we can't love one another unless God's working that love into us. God works it in, we work it out. All right, if, if you... Uh, Let's say there's somebody here. I'll, I'll end with this note on, on this uh, simple application. Let's say that there is someone else in this room that you find less than lovely. Right? You're, they, you don't naturally click with them. You have a hard time with them. And let's say that there's not anything that overt that needs to be picked up or restitution made or apologies made. Let's just say that your personalities were not made for each other. It's just it's something that simple. And you th you've been impressed. God's impressed on you. You know, I really need to love that person. I'm thrown into circumstances with them, and I, I need to love them. Well, you can't, right? You know, you know this, right? You can't love them. So you need to have God give you the love for them and 
Give them what God gives you. So you need to go to God and ask him for the love for that person. And then you say, ah, but that's the sticking point. I'm afraid if I ask God for it, he's going to give it to me. <laughs> See, there's two kinds of prayers that we don't pray. There's the prayer we pr don't pray because we're afraid God will say no, right? Lord, give me three Ferraris and 10 tons of ice cream and the freezers to hold them in. And let, let, let me, let, gimme, gimme, gimme. We're afraid, we suspect deep in our hearts that that's not the kind of prayer God will honor. We, we think that if I pray for a bunch of goodies for myself, that's not going to be honored by God. We, we are reluctant to pray that kind of prayer because we're afraid God will say no. But I'm talking about the kind of prayer that we're reluctant to pray because we know, not we're just afraid, we're, we know that God will say yes. Lord, I need to learn patience. Would you give me occasions to learn patience this week? I can't pray that. Are you crazy? <laughs> I can't. Oh, oh. Lord, give me occasions to show patience to this person that I'm having a hard time loving. I can't pray that. Are you out of your mind? God might do it. The way you're talking, God is almost certainly going to do it. He's going to give you the love and the occasion to show that love to the person that you know you ought to love. That's how it works. God works it in, you work it out. God gives it to you, you give it to someone else. God gives you forgiveness, you give them forgiveness. God gives you grace, you give them grace. God gives you charity, you give them charity. This is what we, we, we are mirrors, reflectors, receptacles. We take in and we give out. We take in and we give out. This is what God's called us to. And what we're giving out is Christ, glory, the hope of glory. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. I pray that as we meditate on these things, that you would give us insight into the opportunities that we have to do what is right in this regard. Father, I pray that you would work into us those things that we need to be working out in our relationship with others. Father, as we pray, we lift up the words uh, to you that Jesus taught us to pray. In the Old Testament, there were three main sacrifices, the sin offering, the ascension offering, or what's sometimes called the burnt offering, and the peace offering. When these three offerings were offered together, they were always offered in that order, and that's one of the reasons why we worship the way we do, why our liturgy is ordered the way that it is. After we're called to worship, we confess our sins, which is our sin offering through the blood of Jesus. Then we hear the word read and proclaimed and lift up our prayers as we ascend in psalms and hymns of praise. This is our ascension offering, our whole burnt offering as God's word cuts us up and puts our whole lives, our whole bodies on his altar as living sacrifices. And then finally, we sit down here to eat the Lord's Supper for our peace offering. This was the offering that always included a meal in the presence of God, signifying that we are at peace with God and we are at peace with with one another. Christ is our peace, and in him and by his blood, all things are being reconciled in heaven and earth. All things are being put back together. In Philippians 4, Paul says to rejoice always and be anxious for nothing, and then he explains to us how to do that. He says that we're to do this by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, making our requests known to God. So this is another aspect of this meal. The Lord's Supper is our weekly thanksgiving meal. We give thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, to make us clean, to make us new, and it is by this thanksgiving that God has made peace and is making peace in this world. And so Paul continues in Philippians 4 and says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So how do we rejoice always, and how are we to be anxious for nothing? You do it by offering up all your anxieties, casting all your cares on him with prayer and supplication to God with thanksgiving. Thank God for everything, especially the hard things. But you can only lift it all up to God in Jesus who was sacrificed for us. But if you lift it all up in Christ, you have to lift it up with thanksgiving because he was sacrificed for us. And if you lift it up in Christ with thanksgiving, then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. So let's pray together. Our Father in God, we lift up this bread and with it we lift up all that we are, our hearts, 
our hurts, our pains, our hopes, our joys, and we lift it all up in Jesus' name, who is our peace. And we thank you that in him, you have made peace and you are making peace. And so we rest in him, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Having given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Amen. Why do we love to watch stories of uh, fixer-uppers? Why do we love that? Why do we like to see shacks turned into these beautiful homes that people can live in or old rust, rusty cars refurbished into something amazing? Why do we love that? Well, we love that because we love glory. That's glory. That's the hope of glory. The crazy thing about the gospel, though, is, is that we want to we wanna fix the house up and then we think we'll invite Jesus in. But the crazy thing about the gospel is that he moves in when it's still a shack. He moves in and begins refurbishing. And that's our hope of glory, that he's there, he's with us. It's a mess, it's a wreck, there's so much to be done. But he's there, he's working, and whatever he's working in you, don't look at the street, at the house down the street, don't look at the wreck over there, just see what he's doing in you. And then what you have there is plenty to share. It's plenty to share, it's plenty to give, it's plenty good for you. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of your God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Spirit be with you and remain in your hearts always. And amen.